And ultimately, of course, if you're really sick and your microbiome is perhaps part of the reason why you're sick, you can have a fecal transplant now, which, uh, you know, is something that, of course, we've been doing for thousands of years and has slowly been rediscovered and reimagined into a modern therapy. Let, let's talk about that then. Um, people, you know, it's not the it's not the loveliest chapter. Um, I yes. won't I won't lie. Um, but why, if they are so miraculous? I mean, you 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 quote someone saying this was a miracle for her husband. Yeah. And you and you come back to them um, at times in the book as just always being this. Essentially, they seem like a miracle treatment. Yeah. Perhaps explain to people what it is. But why is it not being used more often? If it really does, if it really does have yeah. this extraordinary power to heal. So in, in, in this particular example that you're referring to, there was a, a patient of ours at Imperial called Roy, and we talk about him, and he had a superbug infection in his gut called Clostridium difficile, and he had a fecal transplant, and it cured him of his infection, and he got better. And fecal transplant for Clostridium difficile infection in the United Kingdom is now is now approved by NICE, so the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, and it's a, it's a well-established therapy. What it's not is an established therapy for other more experimental conditions like allergies or uh, eczema or, or conditions of the gut like ulcerative colitis. So it, for that, for those conditions, it's more experimental. We're still working out how it works, why it works, how you give it more precisely. But fecal transplantation is also a tool that's been used for a very long period of time as a way to understand what the microbiome is how it works and where it's working, because you can use it in an experimental an experimental setting. Uh, and there was a group in Washington that did some experiments in the early 2000s that kind of reignited our interest in the microbiome through fecal transplantation, where they were able to take um, twins. One twin was lean and the other was uh, obese. And they were able to perform fecal transplantation where they took the feces from the obese twin and put them into a lean mouse and that mouse became obese. So uh, they were then able to reverse that effect by putting in the lean twin species into the same animal. Uh, and we've got countless other examples of this. So fecal transplantation is a blunt instrument. It's a blunt tool for making wholesale changes in the ecology of the gut because we don't have the precision or the real understanding of the complexity of the microbiome to say, OK, we're just going to give you one strain or one bug or one function of those microbes to switch okay. on particular genes that we need. Mm. Okay, so again, I mean, I think we, if we leave that there for the moment, another um, you you talked about diet, and no doubt many people will will be sort yeah. of very interested in diet and sleep and lifestyle changes. But first, can I just um, flag up something you say, which sure. is don't fall for people peddling quick answers and easy cures. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I want to say that before we move to what do feel like quite, quite quick answers in terms of diet. But yes. when you say that, what, what is it that people should feel sceptical about? Is that, you know, probiotics? Is that supplements? Yeah. What, what is it that people should raise an eyebrow when they see being peddled? And you specifically mentioned kind of influences in that yeah. Paragraph. Well, look, uh, so many of the patients that turn up in my clinic with, you know, really chronic problems who perhaps haven't got the answers that they need from traditional modern medicine are quite vulnerable people. They're desperate and they will try anything because these chronic conditions that we're talking about have made their lives really, really uncomfortable and difficult and they've suffered. Uh, and the thing with the microbiome is that I'm like, I'm a, obviously a microbiome evangelist. I believe it's very, very important. But I also acknowledge that we don't know a lot about it. Like we yeah. there's so that we know we know very little, and there's much more that we don't know than we do know. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that when it fits this missing link between, you know, what medicine does well and what it doesn't do badly, it means it's open to abuse. It means that it can fill the it can fill a void and it can be whatever it wants to be to whoever's trying to leverage it for whatever sometimes nefarious use cases they have. So there's lots of people that are very excited online and are trying to push microbiome therapies. And this goes everything from sort of backdoor fecal transplantation. And I just can't say strongly enough that you should not do that uh, to, you know, giving, a, you know, pushing or promoting specific extreme diets or dietary strategies or, or, or supplements that, you know, are supposed to allegedly work through the microbiome. So I think if you're listening to these sorts of um, things online and there's not a consistent message from multiple different users who are all saying the same thing with a really strong evidence base that they can point to and a, and a plausible mechanism through which it works, you should be quite suspicious. Um, and you should think quite carefully about, you know, before you try those supplements. But 
probiotics are a real thing. They really do work. Like they, I prescribe them for my patients. We should use them. The problem that we lack in things like probiotic therapies or many therapies for the microbiome is that word precision. It's how do I know precisely which strain to give which patient at the right time for the right reason to ensure that it's going to really have a health benefit for their particular use case. And at the moment, we just don't have that. So that's about consultation. Yeah. And, and you know, there's a lot of patients at the moment that come to see me who I, I, who I take off probiotics. You know, they're sat there bloated, it's in a lot of discomfort with diarrhea, and they can't understand why, and they're chucking their probiotics. They're saying it should be making it better. And actually, quite a lot of the time, it's about taking... <laughs> stopping everything, letting the gut kind of reacclimatize, and then working through things in a more uh, systematic way. So um, obviously one of the things that people want to know how to do, probiotics aside, in terms of what you put in and what you ingest is obviously with their diet. Um, yes. At the very sort of beginning of the book, you dismiss the paleo diet which people often yeah. think is right. You say it's laughable. Why? Yeah, because this idea that if you... Um, eat a paleo diet and you're living in West London like I do and your gut is going to go back to a paleolithic gut microbiome is just ridiculous it, it absolutely isn't because your gut is living in an urban center and your gut is having to deal with urban pollutants and your gut microbiome is influenced by all of these things all of the time right and and the second reason is that of course a paleolithic man or woman coming to live uh, today their gut microbiome would not have evolved to equip itself with modern life and they would succumb very quickly to pathogens and die. So, but but what I am saying is that nutrition and diet is very, very important. And what the microbiome tells us is that um, the microbiome is highly individualized. So your microbiome and my microbiome is completely different. And, and, and because the microbiome plays such a key role in determining the health benefit or disease risk of your diet or your nutritional strategy, uh, it is therefore very difficult to make generalized assumptions about who should eat what if you're trying to treat a disease. You can do it if you're trying to make general assumptions about a population and how we should prevent disease by more generically eating well, right? So a good example of that would be fiber consumption. Mm. OK, but what about for, so the miracle at the moment where every, you can't sort of um, go anywhere without people yeah. um, evangelizing about fermented foods? Are yeah. they the miracle cure for everyone that they're said to be? I love fermented foods and I strongly recommend you eat them and they're really good for your gut and they do improve biodiversity and they and they help. And uh, I regularly, again, put my patients on them and I say that you really need to have this as part of a structured dietary and nutritional approach to optimizing your health but they are not a panacea, right? They don't miraculously make everything better for the reasons that we talked about at the top of this conversation. Unless we really take the protection of our microbiome seriously, and we say, look, actually, um, we've just got to not destroy it on the <laughs> in the first place and then sustainably grow it with regular you know, consumption of fermented foods, moving away from a westernized global diet and put in the food regulatory framework and food policy framework to enable those things and to sustainably change the human behavior to adopt those things. It won't it won't work. Presumably what will work and what is you would advocate is what not to eat. Yeah. And um, there's just nothing good is there about eating any processed foods when it comes to your microbiome. Yeah. No, not really. No. And, but, but, and look, I think we have to be quite careful because we started this conversation by saying we're living longer, but we're not living happier. Right. So that's the basic premise of what I'm saying. And I'm, I'm saying the microbiome is kind of important to it. Part of the reason we're living longer is not just because we've become really adept at killing pathogens. It's because we've been able to supply a rapidly growing population with a bountiful supply of cheap food, right? Mm. Which is why a cost of living crisis is just so catastrophic because, you know, there's lots of families out there that cannot afford to eat, you know, at the moment and are mm. relying on food banks. And so I don't want to stigmatize cheap foods because actually lots of people live on them. But as a society and as a platform, yeah, it's really problematic. Um, highly, you know, uh, foods that are highly saturated in animal fats, foods that are, you know, reliant on particularly cheap and processed meats, refined sugars, um, foods that are very low in plant-based fibers, uh, diets that are high in sugary drinks, high in alcohol, 
we know are terrible for you and you don't need to be a microbiome scientist to know that. The microbiome simply explains part of the reason why they're so bad for you and why you really, really, really should avoid them. So another thing, you know, as, as we said, it's not about quick and easy, simple cures, but another thing that you talk about that is very important that people will be very interested because they always are to know about. And there's been, yeah. you know, in recent years, um, a lot of people kind of examining sleep. Yeah. Um, you talk about sleep, sleep tight and don't let the bed, bed by bugs bite you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so how much of an impact does the sleep you get when you sleep and how much of it have on your yeah. microbiome? So, so what I find completely bonkers about microbiome science is that every week another paper comes out that just mm-hmm. makes us rethink our relationship with them. And sleep is a really good example because there are particular types of microbes known as oscillators that, that change their activity based on your, on your sleep cycle. Uh, and, uh, we know that those are very important part of the way that a really good night's sleep or getting good i think the kind of rather unpleasant phrase of sleep hygiene um you know improves your health now a lot of the studies on the microbiome were done in things like shift workers and actually you can identify a shift worker without knowing anything about them based on analysis of their microbiome now part of that of course is that shift workers might might i'm a shift worker okay uh might have less good diets they might you know perhaps be in a lower socioeconomic bracket they might do jobs that are perhaps you know not um as conducive to healthy living but even when you account for those things you can still as you can still work out someone's sleep pattern based on their on their microbiome and our microbiome fluctuates in a rhythm not just on our sleep but with some of the other kind of major rhythms of our of our lives as we as as we live so that might be things like your menstrual cycle or you know having children or um you know going into a midlife crisis i think i talked about mine <laughs> a little bit you do and actually you've just reminded me of another truly fascinating part of the book um you talk about the sort of cycles that it influences and you write about reproduction. I, I don't think that many people, and forgive me if they do, and I've missed it, but yeah. know um, just how important it could be to that, yeah. to reproduction. You say the modern microbiome is directly and indirectly influencing our ability to reproduce and may yet serve as a therapeutic avenue for couples struggling to conceive. I mean, is that commonly known? I don't think it's commonly known. I mean, I think, again, it's an example of medicine focusing on the pathogens and the things that cause us harm and not thinking about the communities of microbes that sustain our happiness and our wellness and our, you know, ability to reproduce. So an example of that is sexually transmitted infections. They cause there are 80 million North Americans every year that get an STI and they cause lots of harm. And also, by the way, they cause infertility. They're a really well-established cause of infertility and they're, they're bad. Um, but we think about the, the prevention of those those uh, pathogens and we think about educating our young people. I'll give you I'll give you one example of how like our our you know, urogenital symbionts maintain our fertility and our health. So one example is in women, we know that women who have a a predominant lactobacilli culture within the vagina have less rates of infertility and lower rates of uh, or um, having, you know, complications from their pregnancy. And actually, uh, we are now beginning to experiment with things like vaginal transplantation as a direct cure for infertility. Uh, These are super early studies that are really, again, totally in their infancy. And I don't want to give um you know i want to be quite cautious in my optimism here but if you if you were talking about fertility earlier like we've got a pandemic of obesity we've got a pandemic of global you know cardiovascular disease and of course the declining infertility rate maps onto that you know really precisely and really closely and the microbiome just sits at the intersection of those things so if you look at spermatic motility in males who are morbidly obese it's it's a bit lower right and part of the reason it's lower is because the bugs in the gut are changing the way that these people are able these men are able to make vitamin a and sperm is really dependent on vitamin a for its motility so there are lots of indirect ways and there are direct ways 